It's what, did, what can we learn from our 12,000 soil samples? Grid data value, you guys are out there. What's the value? How many times have you had a consumer? What's grid data going to do me? What's my value of grid data? Well, you can say it should be a value. You're paying $8 an acre, I'll make you something. You really want to look at it and say, okay, what kind of data set can I get to really evaluate the value of grid and what can I do with that? So really started looking at how much variability is out there. I started asking producers for, I first went to larger companies that took grid samples. So let's say, uh, I don't know, whoever pulls a whole lot of grid samples, like, hey, will you give me your grid samples? That doesn't work because of confidentiality and all this stuff. I did find out, though, if you call, talk to a producer and say, hey, Joe, you mind sending me a PDF with your grid samples? You get about 400 fields. And so with that, I've got about 400 fields of producers just send me their PDFs or share with me on SST or e EFC or whatever product they're using. And I've got about 400 fields where I've collected, just been given the grid sample data from. And I'm just playing with that data. And so this is some of the stuff. I've got multiple labs. Um, the goal is to have over 1,000 fields. I'm sitting at 400. And you'll see in a little bit why I want 1,000. I really don't want to stop. This is a data set that I want to keep going and going and going on. Uh, lots of labs. So this is just some of the fun stuff. And how many of you have pulled and looked at grid soil sample data in this room? Everybody that raise your hands will not really be surprised about any of the data I show you, but it's confirmation that yes, this happens, okay? So that's really part of what I'm doing. If I look at the, and if you look at these values, you got soil pH and CEC, you got number of fields. So soil pH, I have soil pH management for 371 fields. When I get results, not everybody runs CEC, but majority do, so I have 313 fields with CEC data, right? Uh, sulfur, I only have 181 fields that people ran sulfur results on, or I got sulfur results. pH, what we're looking at there, across all the fields, and so these fields go from uh, Altus, uh, Gould, up to north of Wichita, and I've even got about half a dozen fields to a dozen fields from north central Kansas, like near Nebraska, okay? But we'll talk about where they're from. On the average of all those fields, average soil pH is 6. So if you are just look, a field's mean pH is 6. Not bad, right? But the average range, so that if you pick out any field, the average range between the, whole, the low pH and the high pH is 2 units. So that means on average the fields go from 5 to 7. Over about a third of the fields, about, well not a third, just under a third, about 27% of the fields have a pH range of greater than three units. So that means if you're at a six, you pull a core, a composite, the composite comes back at a six, that means 27% of the fields have a pH range that goes from 4.5 to 7.5. Are you shocked? No. But this documents it, and the, and, and the crazy thing was, when I showed this data set and I had 80 fields, the average pH was a 6.1. The range was a 2. All I have done by adding more and more fields is just the numbers have not changed by much. They go up, they go down, and they go just by one or, or so units. CC, a range, an average of 13 with a range of 11. CEC from a, from a field. Uh, phosphorus, so this is in PPM, and I've also calibrate Bray, so this is Bray, uh, Bray P1 plus Malik 3, and I've done the conversion to make Bray equal to Malik, and I've got OSU soil test phosphorus brought down to PPM, so this is all the, uh, the Malik 3s uh, and Bray P1s put in there. The mean P value is 30, so 100% sufficient for OSU is 32.5, so we are 99% sufficient on the average. Just like our soil pH, we are perfect on the average. But the range, that means every field is, let's say the mean is 30 plus or minus 60 because I can do that math a lot easier. Let's math that out in your head real quick. 30 with a range of 60, that means basically single digits to I got enough for a decade. On the average in any given field. Right? K, 195, which our, our sufficiency is 125, so on average we're high. The range is equivalent to the mean. So it's not as crazy as phosphorus, but we're still 50%. 50% plus or minus your mean. Uh, organic matter, a swing of about a unit and a half 
or percent and a half, which is a pretty big swing if you think about organic matter when the average is less than two and you have a range of 1.2, meaning we're going on an average field from 0.6 to, to two something. Uh, those samples, we get calcium. I always get this call, and, and people worry about low calcium. We don't have just a ton of low calcium in the southern Great Plains. When, when my average is about 1,500 pounds, and that's a pretty good deal. And mag is at 300, 300, and sulfur at 15. All right, so the fun thing about this, when I get this data set, I tell the producer, I don't want to know where it's at necessarily, but I need to know the county, right? And if you're nice enough, send me the soil series or the Sergo data along with it so I can know what soil series are tied with the samples. But I gotta have county, that's me. If they send me a county name and a list of sample one through 80, and the acreage, that's all I really care about. But I'd love to have a map of where one, sample one was re, a relationship to sample seven and this, you know, no kind of spatial. And even better if I have Sergo to say samples one through seven were in a port, while samples 21 through 48 were in a Norge. And you'll see why that's good, but I've got county and I've got area. So if you look at my sample numbers, got 150 fields from the northwest. I've got uh, the northeast, I've got, uh, 35, the southwest 74, Kansas 112 samples, nothing from the southeast. Nobody's grid sampling in uh, LaFleur County. I tried to get my grandfather-in-law to do it, but he's not. So he doesn't also think nitrogen's good for Bermuda grass, but that's another, good, that's another story. So if we look at it, this has been fun to break apart, and so I can go to a county, if I have enough samples, I can go to your county and say, I got 30 fields from your county, this is the kind of the averages we're seeing. I can also break it up if a consultant sends me all their samples, I can say, here's your samples you're coming in, and if you run multiple counties, here's how each of your counties stack up, or he, here's how each of your clients, if you've got so many clients, here's how your clients stack up on variability. Uh, just showing you some of our ranges as it goes, just to see, it's kind of fun to see areas and some a little bit surprising numbers. The Northwest does, is included in the Panhandle, but I don't have Panhandle data. So I got like one field in the Panhandle, so just know most of this is in that area, uh, K over to Kiowa, Kansas, Burlington, a lot of that region in there. Average pH of six with a range of 2.1. You run that area, you're not surprised that there's a big pH range out there. Not, not at all. Uh, the northeast is 6.2, a little bit higher. Why they lime and a lot of those fields have litter. By the way, these fields, I have all the background, so it ranges from alfalfa to wheat to pasture to corn soy rotation. I've got all that stuff, all these in here. So in the Northeast, a lot of litter, a lot of lime. I mean, the quarries are probably five miles from where a lot of these fields are. So 6.2, but a range of 2.3. Southwest is 6.1, 1.3. And I'm kind of surprised it wasn't higher due to the amount of samples I have near Altus in the Lugert district, but it's, it is what it is. Uh, Kansas is six with a 1.7. Uh, just Foster showing. Uh, up in the northeast, it, it was a little bit surprising with the litter I know they put on. There's still lower average FOSS, 19 ppm on that range. Got 30, 25, and, and 36, 71. Oop, wrong button, sorry. Just go through here so you guys see some of the numbers. With my time limit, I want to just kind of let them flash up there. Organic matter. The southwest, I got to look into that. I was not really sure why the southwest is showing really high organic matter on average. I don't think of the southwest and high organic matter immediately, so I've got to kind of look into that one. And then the CEC on average is about the same, or variance. So, like I said, for those of you that pull samples for a living, this variance isn't new. You know the ranges are great, but now if you want this, I'm happy to share it with you to take to your clients is like, look, this guy from Oklahoma State who doesn't have any buy-in can show you that there's an average range of two units on a field of pH, right? So I'm happy to share that. Say that we have variants. Although they know it, they've been in the combines, they've worked the ground, they know it, they, this is just new numbers to it. Uh, it does show the variability across Oklahoma. Uh, the data sets are really allowing for some extensive ec economic analysis. So that's what we're doing right now. We've got the ag economists putting in different crop rotation, different crop price, different input price. Does variable rate, uh, rate line pay? Does variable rate phosphorus pay? Things like that. Where's our break-evens? Uh, although I've learned a lot from working with, you got any ag economists in the room? I don't think so. We got maybe 
So the ag economists came to me after they first had this. They had about 200 fields like, Brian, variable rate line will not pay in Oklahoma. I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure about that one, but okay, so what kind of parameters? This is about a year and a half ago. It's like, well, we're using $3 wheat. It's like, well, that doesn't help. Okay, I'm kind of getting there. What's your yield range you're using? 30 bushel. It's like, man, nothing pays at 30 bushel, $3 wheat, much less variable rate lime. I know that. So there are levels. I understand variable rate's not going to pay for that 30 bushel producer. But if we start talking to 60, 70 bushel wheat crops, start throwing in double crop soybeans or soybeans or some of those rotations, now something like a variable rate lime really pays. Variable rate phosphorus, if we're using sufficiency, doesn't really pay. I would not grid to, to pay for, to do variable rate phosphorus. I would grid to do variable rate lime and have the phosphorus as a background. Now, if we're doing replacement on our high yielding crops, then we can start talking about it, but you have the, you have the yield monitor by grid data at that point. Uh, I would like to get to a point where I could tell you, say, okay, I got a field, it's primarily in Norge, I got a little bit of pork, uh, or I've got this soil over here that's a grant. I say that Norge has more var variability than grant, you grid sample it first, because it will pay first. If I get enough data, that's my goal, is to say, I can tell you about a variability of a soil. Uh, and I just want to end with some of this. We talked about the variability of soil, and I got a whole five minutes left. So we talked about phosphorus stratification the other day. The data I talked about, I told you that this, the phosphorus in this data was sampling. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate the five-minute warning. Um, the, the, we stratified phosphorus. So this data set, and you guys have probably seen this before, came from nine no-till, long-term no-till farms, kind of near Stillwater, where we did a P-rate study to look at P-response. Can we predict P-response? Can we get it? One of the biggest take-homes, if we had a composite sample from that location and just looked at all the treatments on an average, OSU soil testing rate with the pH addition made top yield every freaking time. On a composite with a six, zero to six inch sample, composite sample as a composite, made it as a, a broad recommendation, we maximize yield with the sufficiency on no-till winter wheat broadcast after the wheat was up. Guess what? We're doing good on the average. That is why the sufficiencies are built. They're built for an average. We got one number from uh, LaFleur County or McCartan County to uh, the Cimarron County. We do good on the average. What we did learn, though, if I wanted to predict what a 10 by 20 foot area was going to do, right, a 10 by 20 foot research plot was going to do, I had no clue. On the average, I was good, but the site specific nature of it was really horrible especially at a zero to six. If I wanted to know exactly what a, zero, uh, uh, a plot was going to do, I had a lot better capability of understanding it or predicting it if I looked at the shallow sample. The rate recommendation was still right as a composite for the zero to six, but better understanding how that field was going to respond, I had to look at the zero to three. It, we're, we're trying to figure it out. I'm about to spend the next three days in Kentucky just talking variable rate phosphorus and what's the future, because we don't know. I can tell you this, phosphorus management using sufficiency was not built for variable rate. It just was not. It works well for a broad scale. It was built to take care of a state, an entire state, so I can give you one number regardless of where you're at and do great on the average, and I will take care of every farmer in Oklahoma in a composite sample and a composite application. But taking that application or that science or that technology into a variable rate world is not what it was meant for. And to be honest, we really don't know what the right way is right now, and the science is, is digging that way. We're trying to figure out the best way to approach, uh, but it's not, phosphorus is a, is a weird animal, animal on variable rate. I thought nitrogen was a pain. Variable rate nitrogen is cake, as long as I know yield and my losses. Phosphorus, it's, it's different. I expect to see something I'm proposing for variable rate if we're in a high removal system. So I'm talking the corn, soy. If we're growing 30 bushel wheat, sufficiency will actually build your soil test. All right? Sufficiency will build your soil test up to near sufficient level by using sufficiency because a 30 bushel wheat crop is not removing a whole lot of phosphorus. You start growing 80 bushel beans, 100 something corn, uh, 70 bushel wheat, now we're removing more than we're putting in and we got to look at replacement. 
However, the replacement values is based upon I'm removing 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 pounds of phosphorus per bushel and not taking any account to what the soil actually needs because of the phosphorus buffering within the soil. That's where we got to go is combining the yield removal by soil uh, buffering, much like lime. Lime is the best variable rate technology we have in nutrient management because we are the most site specific because we have buffering index. Because we will tell you every soil how it will react to the lime because of the, the buffering index solution. We, can't, we don't have a technology where we put known amount of phosphorus into the soil and can tell you what it's going to do. Right? We, not yet anyways. I don't know if we ever will, but that's variable rate lime is the perfect variable rate because we actually have site-specific response to product. We don't have site-specific response to product for phosphorus or potassium. That's where we got to get to. That's my game is using a removal by a soil responsiveness or, or buffering something or other. I don't know what it is. Soil chemists tell me I'm, they've used other words, but let's just say silly. Um, and yeah, I am, but good question. Anything else? Right now for the producers doing high production, a removal is probably the best application if you have soil testing to adjust where you need to be at. But I think we could do a lot better. I just wanted to show, this is right here. This is the variability of 100 by 120 foot area in phosphorus. Dr. Ron documented in the late 90s, I think it was where you did the one foot square and we had significant phosphorus differences within about three to four foot. This was the same thing. We had massive change from one corner of a 100 foot trial to the other corner, both this way and this way.